Hey everyone. Uh, I hope you are staying inside, staying safe and, you know, and enjoying your e-learning this year. I guess this is the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future. So I just wanted to pop on here and introduce how things are going to work. So what I've done and what I'm going to continue to try to do is I've created all of those workbook assignments that I had. Uh, you know, I, I had you guys take your workbook home. Uh, it's going to be the same assignments, but I've turned them into online assignments so that we don't have to worry about like you taking pictures of that and sending it to me, me losing them because that's likely what's going to happen. So from chapter four on or for the foreseeable future, we are going to submit literally everything online. So I will read the chapters to you like I always do using the same program that I'm using now to talk to you. And I'm going to add my commentary in. And now it's super important that you get that commentary because I'm the one who's going to be grading your final. And if I'm talking about these themes throughout the story as I'm reading it, that's stuff that you're going to want to listen to. Of course, I can't make you watch these videos, uh, but I can make you do the assignments. And hopefully you'll take the assignments ser seriously enough that you will, you'll be pretty well off. Uh, by the time it comes for our final exam, because this is the hardest. Uh, it's it's one of my harder assignments all year. Okay, uh, that being said, you're about to see me again, but I'm going to have a completely different look, different hair, different sweatshirt. I made this intro once before, didn't like it, so I'm creating it again. All right, let's get to it. There we go, chapter four. Okay, so Chapter four is called Painted Faces and Long Hair. We learned from chapter three that the long, the hair growth, that was signifying that there was a passage of time on the island. The boys have been there for a significant amount of time at this point, and they're still alive, which is amazing because none of them are older than 12 years old. But yeah, now we're adding a new aspect to it, the painted faces. And we've been talking about themes in this story so far, that there are four major themes uh, one of them is dealing with how the boys go from civilized young gentlemen and their descent into savagery. And we've seen that descent start to begin. At first, the boys were all excited to be on the island. They were working together. They had meetings. There was a system of rules put in place. But we're starting to see those rules being broken. And the things decided in the meetings not being decided or um, they're being decided, but they're not following through with it, like building the shelters, gathering water and everything like that. So I want you to take a guess here. And what do you think the painted faces has to do with this descent into savagery? We're going to revisit that later. I'll may maybe answer it for you, but I'm going to let that hang in your mind for now. Okay, so chapter four, painted faces and long hair. I'm just gonna increase this. You guys don't need to see my face while I'm reading. All right, and I'm going to increase the size of that. The first rhythm that they became used to was the slow swing from the dawn to quick dust. They accepted the pleasures of morning, the bright sun, the whelming sea and the sweet air as a time when, as a time when play was good and life so full that hope was not necessary and therefore forgotten. Toward noon, as the flood of light fell more nearly to the perpendicular, the stark colors of morning were smooth and pearl and opalescence. And the heat, as though the impeding sun's height gave it momentum, became a blow that they ducked, running into the shade and lying there, perhaps even sleeping. Strange things happened at midday. The glittering sea rose up, moved apart in planes of blatant impossibility, the coral reef and a few stunted palms that clung to the more elevated parts would float up into the sky. It would quiver, be plucked apart, run like raindrops on a wire, or be repeated as in an odd succession of mirrors. Sometimes land loomed where there was no land and flicked out like a bubble as the children watched. Piggy discounted all this learnedly as a mirage. And since no boy could reach even the reef over the stretch of water where the, where the snapping sharks waited, they grew accustomed to these mysteries and ignored them, just as they ignored the miraculous throbbing stars. At midday, the illusions merged into the sky, and there was a sun gazed, there the sun gazed down like an angry eye. 
Then, at the end of the afternoon, the mirage subsided and the horizon became level and blue and clipped as the sun declined. That was another time of comparative coolness, but menaced by the coming of dark. When the sun sank, darkness dropped on the island like an extinguisher as soon the shelters were full, and soon the shelters were full of restlessness under their remote stars. Nevertheless, the Northern European tradition of work, play, and food right through the day made it possible for them to adjust themselves wholly to this new rhythm. The little and Percival had early called into a shelter and stayed there for two days, talking, singing, and crying, until they thought him batty and were faintly amused. Ever since then, he had been peaked, red-eyed, and miserable, a little and who played little and cried often. The smaller boys were known now by the gigantic title of Little Uns. The decrease in size from Ralph down was gradual, and though there was a dubious region inhabited by Simon and Robert and Morris, nevertheless, no one had any difficulty in recognizing biggins and biggins at one end and little ones at the other. The undoubted little ones, those aged about six, led a quite distinct and at the same time intense life of their own. They ate most of the day, picking fruit where they could reach it, and not particular about ripeness and quality. They were used to, used now to stomach aches and a sort of chronic diarrhea. They suffered untold terrors in the dark and huddled together for comfort. Apart from food and sleep, they found time for play, aimless and trivial, in the white sand by the bright water. They cried for the mothers much less often than might have been expected. They were very brown and filthy, dirty, filthily dirty. They obeyed the summons of the conch, partly because Ralph blew it and he was big enough to be a, a link with the adult world of authority, and partly because they enjoyed the entertainment of the assemblies. But otherwise, they seldom bothered with the biggins in their passionately emotional and corporate life, and their passionately and emotional and corporate life was their own. They had built castles in the sand at the bar of their little river. These castles were about one foot high and were decorated with shells, withered flowers, and interesting stones. Round the castles was a complex of marks, tracks, walls, railway lines that were of significance only if inspected with the eye of each level. The little ones played here, if not happily, at least absorbed with absorbed attention, and often as many as three of them would play the same together play the game together. Um, I'm gonna stop right here and talk about it real quick. This part right here is just describing how the little ones live almost completely different lives than the big kids. And they're not little ones anymore, they're little ones. And that's how the boys are going to refer to them. It's very obvious, this divide here. While Simon and Morris are like, they're in between the ages of the little ones and the big ones. Um, it's very obvious that they belong in the bigger, the, with the bigger kids group. Uh, versus the little kids group because they are of higher intelligence. Uh, this is going to become significant later on, especially you know, even in this chapter, it's going to become significant. The boys are already separating. Keep that in mind. Three were playing here now. Henry was the biggest of them. He was also a distant relative of that other boy whose mulberry face, mulberry marked face had not been seen since the evening of the great fire. But he was not old enough to understand this. And if he had been told that the other boy had gone home in an aircraft, he would have accepted that statement without fuss or disbelief. Henry was a bit of a leader this afternoon because the other two were Percival and Johnny, the smallest boys on the island. Percival was mouse colored and had not not been very attractive even to his mother. Poor Percival. Johnny was well built, with fair hair and natural belligerence. Just now he was being obedient because he was interested, and the three children kneeling in the sand were at peace. Roger and Morris came out of the forest. Forced. They were relieved from duty at the fire and had come down for a swim. Roger led the way straight through the castles, kicking them over, burying the flowers, scattering the chosen stones. Morris followed, laughing, and added to the destruction. The three little ones paused in their game and looked up. As it happened, the particular marks in which they were interested had not been touched, so they made no protest. 
Only Percival began to whimper with an eyeful of sand, and Morris hurried away. In his other life, Morris had received chastisement for filling a younger eye with sand. Now, now though, there was no parent to let that, to let fall a heavy hand. Morris still felt the unease of wrongdoing. At the back of his mind formed the uncertain outlines of an excuse. He muttered something about a swim and broke into a trot. Roger remained, watching the little ones. He was not noticeably darker than when he had dropped in, but the shock of black hair down his nape and low on his forehead seemed to suit his gloomy face, and made what had seemed at first an unsociable remoteness to into something forbidding. Percival finished his whimper and went on playing, for the tears had washed the sand away. Johnny watched him with china blue eyes, then began to fling up and fling up sand in a shower, and presently Percival was crying again. When Henry tired of his play and wandered off along the beach, Roger followed him, keeping beneath the palms and drifting casually in the same direction. Henry walked at a distance from the palms in the shade because he was too young to keep himself out of the sun. He went down the beach and busied himself at the water's edge. The great Pacific tide was coming in, and every few seconds the re relatively still water of the lagoon heaved forwards an inch. There were creatures that lived in this last fling of the sea, tiny transparencies that came questing in with the water over the hot, dry sand. With impalpable organs of sense, they examined this new field. Perhaps food had appeared where there was, where at last, the, where the last incursion had been, there had been none. Bird droppings, insects, perhaps any of them strewn detritus of landward life. Like a myriad of tiny teeth in a saw, the transparencies came scavenging over the beach. This was fascinating to Henry. He poked about with a bit of stick that itself was wave-worn and withered, oh, sorry, whitened and vagrant, and tried to control the motions of the scavengers. He made little runnels that the tide filled and tried to crowd them with creatures. He became absorbed beyond mere happiness as he himself he felt himself exercising control over the living things. He talked to them, urging them, ordering them. Driven back by the tide, his footprints became bays in which they were trapped and gave him the illusion of mastery. He squatted on his hams at the, ed the water's edge. He bowed with a shock of hair falling over his forehead and passed his eyes, and the afternoon sun emptied down the invisible arrows. Roger waited, too. At first, he had hidden behind the great palm, but Henry's absorption with the transparencies was so obvious that at last he stood out in full view. He looked along the beach. Percival had gone off crying, and Johnny was left in a triumphant possession of the castles. He sat there, crooning to himself and throwing sand at the imaginary Percival. Beyond him, Roger could see the platform and the glints of spray where Ralph and Simon and Piggy and Morris were diving in the pool. He listened carefully, but could only just hear them. A sudden breeze shook the fringe of palm trees so that the fronds tossed and fluttered. Sixty feet above Roger, several nets, fibrous lumps as big as rugby balls were loosened from their stems. They fell about him with a series of hard thumps, and he was not touched. Roger did not consider his escape, but looked from the nets to Henry and back again. The subsoil beneath the palm trees was a raised beach, and the generations of palms had worked loose in, the, in this the stones that had lain on the sands of another shore. Roger stooped, pick up a, picked up a stone, aimed, and threw it at Henry. But he threw it to miss. The stone, that token of preposterous time, bounced five yards to Henry's right and fell in the water. Roger gathered a handful of stones and began to throw them. Yet there was a space around Henry, perhaps six yards in diameter, into which he dare not throw. Here, invincible yet strong, was the taboo of old life. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and school and policemen and the law. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. All right, I'm going to pause here again because there are some things that we, we do need to talk about, uh, very significant things, especially this quote here. This, was, this is one of the most significant quotes 
in the whole book. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. This basically means that Roger is throwing stones at, well, not at Henry, but around Henry because he still worries of the consequences that might happen for that. Earlier talked about he and him and Morris had, they were kicking over the sand castles that the little ones made and sand had gotten into, I think it was Henry's, no, maybe it was person, one of the little ones eyes. And he thought to himself or Morris thought to himself how he had gotten in trouble for sticking sand. He would have gotten in trouble for sticking sand in a kid's eye if he were back at home. And so that's looming in his mind. And that's why he didn't stay with Roger. He goes off and he joins Ralph and Simon at the, at the swimming pool and he goes for a swim, but Roger stays behind. Roger stays behind and he wants to throw the rocks at Henry. He wants to throw them at Henry, but he doesn't. He doesn't because in his mind, there is nothing. There still is that chance that he could get in trouble for doing that. He knows that nobody can get him in trouble for doing that, but he still fears it. So he is still conditioned by that civilization. This quote here is conditioned by the civilization he grew up in. And that's why he doesn't throw the stone. He's still a civilized little boy. He has not descended yet fully into savagery. All right, continuing on. Henry was surprised with the plopping sounds in the water. He abandoned the noise, noiseless transparencies and pointed at the center of the spreading rings like a setter. This side and that the stones fell and Henry turned obediently, but always too late to see the stones in the air. At last he saw one and laughed, looking for the friend who was teasing him. But Roger had whipped behind the palm again, was leaning against it, breathing quickly, his eyelids fluttering. Then Henry lost interest in stones and wandered off. Roger, Jack was standing under a tree about 10 yards away. When Roger opened his eyes and saw him, a darker shadow crept beneath the, the swar swarthing, swarthiness of his skin, but Jack, Jack noticed nothing. He was eager, impatient, beckoning, so that Roger went to him. There was a small pool at the end of the river, dammed back by the sand and full of white water lilies and needle-like reeds. Here, Sam and Eric were waiting, and Bill. Jack, concealed from the sun, knelt by the pool and opened two large leaves that he carried. One of them contained white clay and the other red. By them lay a stick of charcoal brought down from the fire. Jack explained to Roger as he worked. They don't smell me. They see me, I think. Something pink under the trees. He smeared on the clay. If only I had some green. He turned a half-concealed face up to Roger and answered the incomprehension of his gaze. It's for hunting, like in a war, you know, dazzle paint, like things trying to look, look like something else. He twisted in the urgency of telling, like moths on a tree trunk. Roger understood and then nodded gravely. The twins moved toward Jack and began to protest timidly about something. Jack waved them away. Shut up. He rubbed the charcoal stick between the patches of red and white on his face. No. You to come with me. He peered at his reflection and disliked it. He bent down, took up a double handful of lukewarm water and rubbed the mess from his face. Freckles and sandy eyebrows appeared. Roger smiled unwillingly. <laughs> you don't look off a mess. Jack planned his new face. He made one cheek and one eye socket white and then rubbed the red over the other half of his face and slashed a black bar of charcoal across from right ear to left jaw. He looked in the pool for his reflection, but his breathing troubled the mirror. Simon Eric, get me a coconut, an empty one. He knelt holding the shell of water. A rounded patch of sunlight fell on his face and a brightness appeared in the depths of the water. He looked in astonishment, no longer at himself, but at the awesome stranger. He split the water and leapt to his feet, laughing excitedly. Beside the pool, his sinewy, body held up a mask that drew their eyes and appalled them. He began to dance and his laughter became bloodthirsty, snarling. He capered toward Bill and the mask was a thing on its own, behind which Jack hid, liberated from shame and self-consciousness. 
The face of red and white and black slung through the air and jigged toward Bill. Bill started up laughing. Then suddenly he fell silent and blundered away through the bushes. Okay, I'm going to stop again because this quote is also very significant. It's getting darker here, so sorry about the lighting. Anyway, <clears throat> the mask was a thing on its own behind which Jack hid, liberated from shame and self-consciousness. Again, this is foreshadowing. This is going to come back later in the story in a more significant way. Because Jack is able to paint his face, he can hide behind this mask. But what does that mean? What does it mean to hide behind the mask? The easiest thing that I compare it to, can compare it to, the easiest thing to understand is like uh, comments on the internet. People use the mask of their screen and they hide behind it. They think they can say whatever they want to whomever they want on the internet with no consequences because they're not having to say it in person. They can hide behind the screen of their computers. This is the very similar theme in our story. Jack now has a mask. He feels liberated from shame and self-consciousness, which is going to make him more bold. It's going to make him bolder and more daring. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that so far, but keep that in mind as we read. So Bill started, started up laughing, and then suddenly he fell silent and blundered away through the bushes. Jack rushed toward the twins. The rest are making a line. Come on. But we, come on, or creep up and stab. The mask compelled them. Ralph climbed out of the bathing pool and trotted up the beach and sat in the shade beneath the palms. His fair hair was plastered over his eyebrows, and he pushed it back. Simon was floating in the water and kicking with his feet, and Morris was practicing diving. Piggy was mooning about, aimlessly picking up the things and discarding them. The rock pools, which so fascinated him, were covered by the, side, by the tide, so he was without an interest until the tide went back. Presently, seeing Ralph under the palms, he came and sat by him. Piggy wore the remainders of a pair of shorts. His fat body was golden brown, and the glasses still flashed when he looked at anything. He was the only boy on the island whose hair never seemed to grow. The rest were shock-headed. But Piggy's hair still lay in wisps over his head, as though baldness were his natural state, and this imperfect covering would soon go, like the velvet on a young stag's antlers. I've been thinking, he said, about a clock. We could make a sundial. We could put a stick in the sand, and then... His effort to express the mathematical process involved was too great, and he made few passes instead. And an airplane, and a TV set. No, hold on, that was wrong. And an airplane and a TV set, said Ralph sourly. And a steam engine. Piggy shook his head. Oh, you, you have to have a lot of mental things for that, he said. No, we haven't got no metal, but we've got a stick. Ralph turned and smiled involuntarily. Piggy was a bore. His fat, his asthmar, and his matter-of-fact ideas were dull. But there was always a little pleasure to be got out of pulling his leg even if one did it by accident. Piggy saw the smile and misinterpreted it as friendliness. There had been grown-up sorry. There had been grown up tactically among the biggins the opinion that Piggy was an outsider, not only by accent, which did not matter, but by fat and asthmar and specs, and a certain disinclination for manual labor. Now finding that something he had was made said made Ralph smile. He rejoiced and pressed his advantage. We've got a lot of sticks. We could have a sundial each. Then we should know what the what the time is. A fat lot good that would be. You said you wanted things done, so as we could be rescued. Oh shut up. He leapt to his feet and trotted back to the pool, just as Morris did a rather poor dive. Ralph was glad of a chance to change the subject. He shouted as Morris came to the surface. Belly flop! Belly flop! Morris flashed a, simple, a smile at Ralph, who slid easily into the water. Of all the boys, he was the most at home there. But today, irked by the mention of rescue, the useless footling mention of rescue, even the green depths of water and the shattered golden sun held no ball. Instead of remaining and playing, he swam with steady strokes under Simon and 
crawled out of the other side of the pool to lie there, sleek and streaming like a seal. Piggy, always clumsy, stood up and came to stand by him, so that Ralph rolled on his stomach and pretended not to see. The mirages had died away, and gloomily he ran his eye along the taut blue line of the horizon. The next moment, what, he was on his feet and shouting, Smoke! Smoke! Simon tried to sit up in the water and got a mouthful. Morris, who had been standing ready to dive, swayed back on his heel, made a bolt for the platform, and then swerved back to the grass under the palms, where he started to pull on his tattered shorts and ready for anything. Ralph stood, one hand holding his back, holding back his hair, the other clenched. Simon was climbing out of the water. Piggy was rubbing his glasses on his shorts and squinting at the sea. Morris had got both legs through the one leg of his shorts. All of the boys, of all the boys, only Ralph was still. Well, I can't see no smoke, said Piggy incredulously. I can't see no smoke. Ralph, where is it? Ralph said nothing. Now both his hands were clenched over his forehead so that the fair hair was kept out of his eyes. He was leaning forward and already the salt was whitening his body. Ralph, where's the ship? Simon stood by, looking at Ralph from the horizon. Morris's trousers gave away with a sigh and he abandoned them as, as a wreck rushed toward the forest and then came back again. The smoke was a tight little knot on the horizon. It was a tight little knot on the horizon and was uncoiling slowly. Beneath the smoke was a dot that might be a funnel. Ralph's face was pale as he spoke to himself. They'll see all smoke. Piggy was looking in the right direction now. We don't, we don't look much. He turned around and peered at the mountain. Ralph continued to watch the ship ravenously. Collar was coming back into his face. And Simon stood by him, silent. I know I can't see much, said Piggy, but have we got any smoke? Ralph moved impatiently, still watching the ship. The smoke on the mountain. Morris came running and stared out to sea. Both Simon and Piggy were looking up at the mountain. Piggy screwed up his face, but Simon cried out as though he had hurt himself. Ralph! Ralph! The quality of his speech twisted Ralph on his hand. You tell me, said Piggy, is there a signal? Ralph looked back at the dispersing smoke on the horizon and up at the mountain. Ralph, please, is there a signal? Simon put out his hand timidly to touch Ralph, but Ralph started to run, splashing through the shallow end of the bathing pool, across the hot white sand under the palms. A moment later, he was battling with a complex undergrowth that was already engulfing the scar. Simon ran after him. Then Morris, Piggy shouted, Ralph, please, Ralph! Then he, too, started to run, stumbling over Morris's discarded shorts before he was across the terrace. Behind, behind the four boys, the smoke moved gently across, along the horizon. And on, each be on the beach, Henry and Johnny were throwing sand at Percival, who was crying quietly again. And all three were in complete ignorance of the excitement. By the time Ralph had reached the land, landward end of the scar, he was using precious breath to swear. He did, dis he did desperate violence to this to his naked body among the rasping creepers so that blood was sliding over him, sliding over him. Just where the steep ascent of the mountain began, he stopped. Morris was only a few yards behind him. Piggy specks, shouted Ralph. If the fire's all out, we need them. He stopped shouting and swayed on his feet. Piggy was only just visible, bumbling from the beach. Ralph looked at the horizon, then up to the mountain. Was it better to fetch Piggy's glasses, or would the ship have gone? Or if they climbed on, supposing the fire was all out, and and they had to watch Piggy crawling nearer and the ship sinking under the horizon. Balanced in a high peak of need, agonized by indecision, Ralph cried out, Oh God, oh God! Simon, struggling with the bushes, caught his breath. His face was twisted. Ralph blundered on, savaging, savaging himself at the wisp of smoke as the wisp of smoke moved on. The fire was dead. They saw that straight away. They saw what they had really known down on the beach and when the smoke of home had beckoned. The fire was out, smokeless and dead. The watchers were gone. A pile of unused fuel lay ready. Ralph turned to the sea. The horizon stretched, impersonal once more, barren of all but the faintest trace of smoke. Ralph ran stumbling along the rocks, saved himself on the edge of the pink cliff and screamed at the ship, come back, come back. He ran backwards and forwards along the cliff, his face always to the sea and his voice rose insanely, come back, come back. Simon and Morris arrived. Ralph looked at them with unwinking eyes. Simon turned away, smearing the water from his cheeks. Ralph reached inside himself for the worst word he knew. They let the bloody fire go out. 
He looked down the unfriendly side of the mountain. Piggy arrived out of breath and whimpering like a little one. Ralph clenched his fist and went very red. The intentness of his gaze, the bitterness of his voice, pointed for him. There they are. A procession had appeared far down among the pink stones that lay near the water's edge. Some of the boys wore black caps, but otherwise they were almost naked. They lifted sticks in the air together whenever they came to an easy patch. They were chanting something to do with a bundle that the errant twins carried so carefully. Ralph picked out Jack easily, even at a distance, tall, red-haired, and inevitably leading the procession. Simon looked now from Simon looked now from Ralph to Jack, as he had looked from Ralph to the horizon, and what he saw seemed to make him afraid. Ralph said nothing more, but waited while the procession never came. Whoa, no, that's not right. Ralph said nothing more, but waited while the procession came nearer. The chant was audible, but at the distance still wordless. Behind Jack walked the twins, carrying a great stake on their shoulders. The gutted carcass of a pig swung from the stake, swinging heavily as the twins toiled over the uneven ground. The pig's head hung down with with gaping neck and seemed to search for something on the ground. The last words of the chant floated to them across the bowl of blackened wood and ashes. Kill the pig, cut the throat, spill her blood. Yet as the words became audible, the procession reached the steepest part of the mountain. And in a minute or two, the chant had died away. Piggy sniveled and Simon shushed him quickly as though he had spoken too loudly in church. Jack, his face smeared with clays, reached the top first and hailed Ralph excitedly with lifted spear. Look! We've killed a pig. We stole up on them. We got in a circle. Voices broke in from the hunters. Sorry, voices broke in from the hunters. We got in a circle, crept up. The pig squealed. The twins stood with the pig swinging between them, dropping black gouts on the rock. They seemed to share one wide ecstatic grin. Jack had too many things to tell Ralph at once. Instead, he danced a step or two and then remembered his dignity and stood still grinning. He noticed blood on his hands and grimaced distastefully, looked for something on which to clean them, wiped them on his shorts and laughed. Ralph smoked. You let the fire go out. Jack checked, vaguely irritated by this irrelevance, but too happy to let it worry him. We can light the fire again. You should have been with us, Ralph. We had a smashing time. The twins got knocked over. We hit the pig. I fell on top. (laughs) I cut the pig's throat, said Jack proudly, and yet twitched as he said "Said it. Can I borrow yours, Ralph, to make a nick in the hilt? The boys chattered and danced. The twins continued to grin. There was lashings of blood, said Jack, laughing and shuddering. You should have seen it. We'll go hunting every day. Ralph spoke again hoarsely. He had not moved. You let the fire go out. This repetition made Jack uneasy. He looked at the twins and then back at Ralph. We we had to have them in the hunt, he said. Oh, there wouldn't have been enough for a ring. He flushed, conscious of a fault. There's only been one. It's The fire's only been out for an hour or two. We can light it up again. He noticed Ralph's scarred nakedness and the somber silence of all four of them. He sought charitable in his happiness to include them in the thing that had happened. His mind was crowded with memories, memories of the knowledge that had come to them when they had closed in on the struggling pig, knowing that they had outwitted a living thing, imposed their will upon it, taken away its life like a long, satisfying drink. He spread his arms wide. You should have seen the blood. The hunters were more silent now, but at this, they buzzed again. Ralph flung his hair back, flung back his hair. One arm pointed at the empty horizon. His voice was loud and savage and struck them into silence. There was a ship. Jack's, Jack faced at once with too many awful implica- implications, ducked away from them. He laid a hand on the pig's pig and drew his knife. Ralph brought his arm down, fist clenched, and his voice shook. There was a ship out there. You said you'd keep the fire going, and you let it out. He took a step toward Jack, who turned and faced him. They might have seen us. We might have gone home. This was too bitter for Piggy, who forgot his timidity, 
and in the agony of his loss, he began to cry out shrilly, You and your blood, Jack and Maradou! You and your hunting! We might have gone home! Ralph pushed Piggy to one side. I was the chief, and you were going to do what I said. You talk, but you can't even build huts. Then you go off hunting and let the let out the fire. He turned away silent for a moment. Then his voice came again on a peak of feeling. There was a ship. One of the smaller hunters began to wail. The dis dismal truth was filtering through to everybody. Jack went very red as he hacked and pulled the pig. The job was too much. We needed everyone. Ralph turned. You could have had everyone when the shelters were finished, but you had to hunt. We needed meat. Jack stood up, and as he said this, the bloody knife in his hands, the two boys faced each other. There was the brilliant world of hunting, tactics, fierce exhilaration, skill, and then there was the world of longing and baffled common sense. Jack transferred the knife to his left hand and smudged blood over his forehead as he pushed down the plastered hair. Piggy began again. You didn't ought to have let that fire out. You said you'd keep the smoke going. This from Piggy and the wails of agreement from some of the hunters drove Jack to violence. The bolting look came into his blue eyes. He took a step and able at last to hit someone struck his fist into Piggy's stomach. Piggy sat down with a grunt. Jack stood over him. His voice was vicious with humiliation. You would, you, you would, would you, fatty? Ralph made a step forward and Jack smacked Piggy's head. Piggy's glasses flew off and tinkled, tinked on the rocks. Piggy cried out in terror. My specs! He went crouching and feeling over the rocks, but Simon, who got there first, found them for him. Passions beat about, about Simon on the mountaintop with awful wings. One side's broken! Piggy grabbed and put on his glasses, and he looked malevolently at Jack. I've got to have them specs! Well, now I only got one eye! Just you wait! Jack had made a move toward Piggy, who, was, who scrambled away until the great rock lay between them. He thrust his head over the top and glared at Jack through his one flashing glass. Now I only got one eye. Just you wait. Jack mimicked the line and scrambled. Just you wait, yeah. Piggy and the parody was so were so funny that the hunters began to laugh. Jack felt encouraged. He went on scrambling, and the laughter rose to a gale of hysteria. Unwillingly, Ralph felt his lips twitch. He was angry with himself for giving way. He muttered, That was a dirty trick. Jack broke out of his gyration and stood facing Ralph. His words came to shout, All right, all right. He looked at Piggy, all the hunters, and at Ralph. I'm sorry about the fire, I mean. There, I... He drew himself up. I apologize. The buzz from the hunters was one of the admiration at his handsome behavior. Clearly, they were of the opinion that Jack had done the decent thing, had put himself in the right by his generous apology, and Ralph obscurely in the wrong. They waited for an appropriately decent answer. Yet, Ralph's throat refused to pass one. He resented, resented, as an addition to Jack's misbehavior, this verbal trick. The fire was dead. The ship was gone. Could they not see? Anger instead of decency passed his throat. That was a dirty trick. They were silent on the mountaintop while the opaque look appeared in Jack's eyes and passed away. Ralph's final word was ingrati an ingracious mutter. All right, light the fire. With some positive action before them, a little of ten the tension died. Ralph said no more. He did nothing. He stood looking down at the ashes around his feet. Jack was loud and active. He gave orders, sang, whistled, threw remarks at the silent Ralph, remarks that did not need an answer and therefore could not invite a snub. And still Ralph was silent. No one, not even Jack, would ask him to move and, move, and in the end they had to build a fire three yards away in a place not really as convenient. So Ralph asserted his chieftainship and could not have chosen a better way. A better way if he had fought for days. Against this weapon, so indefinable and so effective, Jack, Jack was powerless and raved without knowing why. By the time the pile was built, they were on different sides of the high barrier. When they had dealt with the fire 
another crisis arose. Jack had no means of lighting it. Then, to his surprise, Ralph went to Piggy and took the glasses from him. Not even Ralph knew how a link between him and Jack had been snapped and fastened elsewhere. I'll bring them back. I'll come too. Piggy stood behind him. Islanded in the sea of meaningless color while Ralph knelt and focused on the glossy spot. Instantly, the fire was alight. Piggy held out one of his hands and grabbed the glasses back. Before these fascinatingly attractive flowers of violet, violet and red and yellow, unkindness melted away. They became a circle of boys around the campfire, and even Piggy and Ralph were half drawn in. Soon, some of the boys were rushing down the slope and more wood while Jack slope for more wood while Jack hacked the pig. They tried holding the whole carcass on a stake over the fire, but the stake burnt more quickly than the pig roasted. In the end, they skewered bits of meats on branches and held them in flames. And even then, almost as much, almost as much boy was roasted as meat. Ralph dribbled. He meant to refuse meat, but his past diet of fruit and nuts with an odd crab of fish gave him too little resistance. He accepted a piece of half raw meat and gnawed it like a wolf. Piggy spoke, also dribbling. Aren't I having one? Aren't I having none? Jack had meant to leave him in doubt as an assertion of power, but Piggy, by advertising his omission, made more cruel, cruelty necessary. You didn't hunt. No, no more than Ralph did, said Piggy wetly. No, Simon, he amplified. There isn't more than a, than a hap the meat in that crab. Ralph stirred uneasily. Simon sitting between the twins and Piggy wiped his mouth and shoved a piece of meat, meat over the rocks to Piggy who grabbed it. The twins giggled and Simon lowered his face in shame. And then Jack leapt to his feet slashed off a great hunk of meat and flung it down at Simon's feet. Eat, don you, he glared at Simon. Take it, he spun on his heels, center of bewildered circle of boys. I got you meat. Numberless and inexpressible frustrations combined to make this rage elemental and awe-inspiring. I painted my face, I stole up, now you eat, all of you, and I... He slowed, slowly, the silence of the mountain top deepened until the click of fire and soft hiss of roasting of roasting meat could be heard clearly. Jack looked round for understanding, but found only respect. Ralph stood among the ashes of the signal fire, his hands full of meat, saying nothing. Then at last Morris broke the silence. He changed the subject to only one that could bring the majority of them together. Where did you find the pig? Roger pointed down the unfriendly side. They were there by the sea. Jack, recovering, could not bear to have his story told. He broke in quickly. We sped, spread round. I crept on the hands and knees. The spears fell out because they hadn't barbs on. The pig ran away and made an awful noise. It turned back and ran into the circle, bleeding. All the boys were talking at once, relieved and excited. We closed in. The first blow paralyzed its hind quarters. And so then the circle could close in and beat and beat. I cut the pig's... Oh, I cut the pig's throat, that was Jack. The twins, still sharing their identical grin, jumped up and ran around each other. Then the rest joined in, making pig dying noises and shouting. One foot his knob, give him a full penny one. Then Morris pretended to be the pig and ran squealing into the center, and the hunter, circling still, pretended to beat him. As they danced, they sang, kill the pig, cut her throat, bash her in, bash her in. Ralph watched them, envious and resentful, not until they flagged and the chant died away, did he speak. I'm calling an assembly. One by one they halted and stood watching him. With the conch, I'm calling a meeting, even if we have to go on into the dark, down on the platform, when I blow it, now. They turned away and walked off down the mountain. Okay, guys, so a lot of stuff has happened in this chapter. Um... We can definitely see this separation and this differences between Ralph and Jack's priorities and their ideals and what they seem to think is important. Sorry, I got my, my little darling cat here with me. Hey, this is Tonks. Say hello, Tonks. Um, anyway, where is it? Basically, they could have been saved. 
Jack's negligence, the boys' negligence here in not keeping the fire going kept them from being noticed. There was a ship that could have seen them there. But there was no fire. So nobody noticed them. And Ralph immediately blames all of this on Jack because that was his responsibility to keep the fire going so that they could be rescued. And Jack's like, but we needed meat. We had to have meat. We might die if we didn't have meat. While that is true, they wouldn't have really needed it if they were to be rescued. So who's in the right? Okay. Was it more important for them to grab meat or is rescue more important? This is going to be a question that is, I'm going to continue to ask as the story moves forward. Is it more important for, to have meat or is it more important to keep the fire going? We've saw to, we saw today the consequences of not keeping the fire going. But is that going to change later on in the story? The boys have an interesting reaction to Jack's apology. Jack apologizes to Ralph and everybody for letting the fire go out and their chance of rescue disappearing. And the boys like that. They're like, wow, that was awesome of him. He is the better man. Way to go, Jack. Ralph doesn't apologize. And so now he looks bad, according to the boys, because I mean, he wasn't the bigger man. He didn't apologize. And this is my personal opinion. You can feel free to disagree with me, but I don't think Ralph needed to apologize. He did his job. Jack did not. Therefore, Jack, does, Jack rightfully needed to apologize, which he did, which is very noble of him. But Ralph really didn't need to apologize. Maybe, maybe he could have apologized for how he said those things to Jack and how like, angry he got and he took out his frustrations in that way. But again, I think he had every right to be that mad. They could have been saved. Their, their lives could have been saved. And so, yeah, I think he was justified in being mad. Uh, anyway, that's just my thoughts. All right. Now that you've read it, make sure that you go in Again, I will have an online version of this made, but you're going to go in and answer these, these questions here on that. Don't do chapter five. Just do the chapter four ones. Okay. Is this chapter four too? Oh, I forgot a whole page earlier when I was describing it. Hmm, that probably confused you, but you guys know how this works. If you have any questions, let me know. You can text me anytime. <laughs>